This is for the nerds, this is for the brainiacs, this is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back, you ain't gonna touch me, you not gonna do nothing, you are not above me, I bet you wish you was me, I know it, I know. What's up everybody, welcome to another episode of the Only Friends Podcast. We have a real action-packed episode today, with all the shit that we didn't get to yesterday. Later, what are we talking about today? <laughs> Whatever we didn't talk about yesterday. What well, do we want to talk about yesterday? Our pre-production meeting every single morning is <laughs> everybody sitting around, cracking jokes, sending memes back and forth, and then Landon <laughs> just rocking in his chair. Or you, at least he rocks in his chair instead of pacing around, knocking things over. Well, it depends. He if he has his headphones in, then he's in the pace mode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and also yeah, push-ups. Bull, right, bull in China shop. And then finally, like, he comes to a rest and he goes, What are we talking about today? That's not how I sound. No, Every that's time. Exactly, that's that's exactly how I sound. That was a pretty you know, good act. That was that word for word. Yeah. No, it is word for word how I speak, not how I sound. I said, <laughs> No, no, because word for word, that's what I say. I say, What are we talking about you today? But I looked like at him. The cadence too. was off. I looked at him and I said, Matt. What are we talking about? Oh today? my god, the, the balls on this kid. <laughs> I know, what are you talking about? Imagine he goes, you. Oh my god, you're so you. fucking ridiculous. Imagine if he ever used that tone in any <laughs> conversation with me ever. <laughs> Alright, Matt, what are we talking about today? <laughs> Alright, Matt. Well, Landon, I'm glad you asked that. Well, I'm gonna today, ask it again, I'm gonna ask today. it tomorrow, I'm gonna ask it the next day. If we're gonna, gonna be talking, talking about Landon today. A little bit of news, a little bit of uh, notes that are taking place in the poker. Arena, you know, we got a lot of things. News and notes. News and notes. News it's, and notes. It's a, it's a like little a bit of a catch-up day, if okay. you will. We'll catch Not Heinz Fifty Seven ketchup, mm. but just catch. You know, that's up. a terrible fucking joke. Pat's up. That was that was a Brian joke. He yeah. sneaks some in sometimes <laughs> where we just like talk over the it. The toe tack tick was great. The that was so you. quick. That, that was, was so you. fucking good. No, he does so have a couple fast. really good zingers. <laughs> Once in a while, I get one in there. Uh, there was another one that I let me speak. There was another one I was. I was listening back yesterday and he snuck one in that was so bad and such a bad dad joke uh, that we didn't even acknowledge it. What was it? I can't remember. Damn. I wish I would have been more. I'm sure it was so good. It was, it was so good I laugh. to people who have humor. That, that's, what happens. that's what happens when you get older, man. They call all of like your, your things that sound good. They call them zingers. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's what you are. You're just a zinger guy now. Mm -hmm. like, no, that's good. Zingers imply quick wit. Mm. Yeah. It implies that, you know, there's that one second of comedic timing that you can sneak one in and LaManna doesn't miss it. He right, does. exactly. Yeah. Quick. Unless we <laughs> <can't> <laughs> I'm a numbers guy. If I throw out a thousand of them, like three have to be good. So yeah, that's true. Totak Tick was 50 really good. 50% will be heard, and of that 50%, 50% yeah. will hit. I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm actually so bothered right now that I can't remember what it was it how bad it was no, no 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 that, that one, one was good. that one was good yeah that was, uh, that was worth remembering. no this one was literally someone else was talking and he tried to like sneak it in underneath like <laughs> their conversation and we weren't having it and i listened to it back and i was like i'm so glad no one heard that oh, <laughs> man. i, I definitely was. laughed at it <laughs> Man, these are little That's Easter eggs that the daily listener can, you know, really kind of pull out. It's All not right. saying much when Comet says he laughs at it because he laughs at literally everything. Not everything. Not everything. Ninety percent. The only things he doesn't laugh at are the things that I find belly laugh funny. Uh, that is <laughs> actually very yeah. fucking true. I have yeah. literally no reactions to these things. Yeah, you're a laugh whore. Is what it comes down to, or if no. you will, a ratchet ass laugher. <laughs> mm. Is that with a W? Yes. I guess one of the Yeah, Just see? to confirm. <laughs> Can't breathe. You're trying too fucking hard, man. <laughs> me or him? You! <laughs> Why me? What did I do? Landon's telling somebody they're trying too hard. Trying too hard. <laughs> what did I do? I didn't try anything. Trying too hard. I just knew that there were two words. That's all. If I, did, if I didn't know the wrench existed, R A C T R A C H E T. <laughs> yeah. That's how you get mad is you force him to spell on air. Racked. Yeah. Oh, Racked man. Get. What, what the fuck did Conrad say yesterday? He ended it with a T? Oh, oh, oh cousin. Cousin. <laughs> cousin. <laughs> cousin. And then we go on this, we go on this whole segment about adding a letter or not in order to separate words. He just out of the blue goes, that's my cousin. Cousin, yeah. But then he spelled it DT. Yeah. He spelled it DT. <laughs> we were talking about how to spell sophomoric. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Cousin came cousin. in there. 
He really wanted to emphasize that it was the past tense of cousin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> my former cousin. My cousin. <laughs> my former cousin. My cousin and cousin uh, All right, what do we want to kick the show? Did you know that uh, Lake Mead's running out of water? Yes. Uh, oh, did you know what that it means? It rained yesterday. Huh? Rained yesterday. It did rain yesterday, so Lake Mead's up. Yeah, it's fine. Lake Lake Mead. Mead. <laughs> there was actually normal? footage of like it water pouring into Lake Mead Bigger from business um, as usual. Yeah, I think off of the but Hoover Dam. Bad for which was anyone nice who's see. bounty hunting. Uh, no, actually. Very no? good. The bounty hunters are still doing just fine. Another body washed up on shore today at Lake Mead. Yeah. Probably so the they didn't even need to go and find it. It just came up. Just shows right, up. Just 5K was washed yeah. up on shore. I think I, I would I would bet there's about a half a million dollars worth of bounties there's in that a lake. lot. There has to be. Yeah. I saw a picture of it was just a boat that had to been under the water for decades, and it was just standing straight up, like in I in mean, the ground. That it like was obviously underwater, but I'm since it's receded, it, there's yeah. And I there's mean, a, and there's a dead body inside it. Of course. <laughs> I, that Maybe. would be cool. Maybe there's a few, and then you get like 20k just from finding the boat. It's two main event buy-ins. Man, I feel <laughs> I feel very uncomfortable talking about profiteering on the death of others. I played They're too many like dead. video games where well, you have to search. Well, to be for fair, it, it's not <laughs> off the death of others. It yeah, was off of the them. murder of others. Oh, mm-hmm. right. It's we're way helping. different. Yeah, we're solving mysteries. Yeah. yeah. We're like uh, a modern day Scooby Doo. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you're like Shaggy. I am definitely not the Shaggy of the group. If no, anything, he's the Shaggy without the Conrad's hair. Conrad's the Shaggy. Of the group. Conrad's the Shaggy, like <laughs> lifestyle wise. Landon looks like Shaggy. No, I don't, bro. I don't have the same hair anymore. I, I mean, it's close enough. Uh, Dude, you're ridiculous. Zoinks! <laughs> you're ridiculous. You're ridiculous. Scooby Dooby Doo. Yeah, he's Shaggy. I don't know how I, turn, right. I don't know how I can turn the concern into others, into getting roasted by. You. Well, yeah, I'll help. No. <laughs> Talk well, about your news and notes, man. Lamana is obviously Velma. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> man, I would make a perfect Velma. No, 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 no the girl Velma. version of you. The, the, the girl, girl version yeah, of that's me. You, that's yeah. Velma. Rihanna. Yeah. Rihanna <laughs> Velma. Rihanna's fly as fuck. <laughs> You love you love women that look like Lamana. No, I don't. <laughs> yes, you do. Look like Lamana. Oh, we went through this. Already. You're a woman out there. You look like Brian Lamana. Who, who's the other? Yep. Who's the Nikki other Glazer. Nikki Glazer. You think, okay, can we all talk about how ridiculous this is? First of all, no, Nikki Glazer like is that's gorgeous. Brian. Look, it's Brian. And Nikki Glazer is like gorgeous. Brian. They yep. have the same face. How same. on earth? She has a pointed chin. We have yeah, the same but round like, face. They're... She has no attributes that look like Brian. Same as that The inner face. The same as that Bones. What Man. are you? No, she doesn't. She has very they, elevated cheekbones. That's she's, basically look, Brian. Look how pronounced yeah. her cheekbones are. Look how pretty Brian's cheekbones are. Can you put a beard on her? Can, wait, can, <laughs> we put, can we put the, the, the graphic of Velma Lamana and Nikki Glazer and see how close they look? I don't, I don't think little, we have Brianna on hand. But, uh, we can get Brianna. Uh, I think that this is like such a ridiculous take. First of all, she's in better shape than Lamana was at 16. <laughs> Secondly, I mean, she's mean. actually naturally beautiful, and this guy is. I am naturally a rugged beautiful. Mess. As well. She's naturally beautiful. What? Rugged They're, mess. They look exactly. Look the at same. this face. <laughs> That's the tortoise you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Every time look you guys this skin tone. I don't know what you're talking about. Every time you guys speak, not a all you do is disqualify your voices. You, you just say That's things that are so ridiculous. Well, that the audience says, "Okay, I can't listen to them yeah, any longer." I, well, I just want to let you know it's five to, to two. Um, right now that oh. Lamana looks like Nick. Oh, so you're so. saying five people in the chat want to gaslight me. Fine. Fine. No, no, no. I'm here for obviously it. see the resemblance. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm obviously exactly. here for it. Don't don't talk down to our, okay. our audience yeah, like that. Do you think they give a fuck about yeah. gaslighting you? Yes. Audience, yes, absolutely. Great. I think it gives <laughs> audacity on this shit. No, audience My gives God. gives proper feedback, very very honest feedback. Right. Every yeah. single totally time. objective. Right. Very yeah. smart, Every single very time. intellectual. And we appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Thanks. There there is uh Thanks, Nikki. absolutely <laughs> 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 I can't tell the difference. It's Velma, okay? Uh, <laughs> what was the other girl's name in Scooby-Doo? Uh, Daphne. Daphne. Daphne was the blonde, right? Daphne no, was, Daphne was the... Fred, I was Fred. Daphne had, like, red, reddish hair. Yeah. Yeah, right. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Velma was, like, the, the glasses. Okay. Velma, cut. Velma was glasses. Mm-hmm. Velma yeah. was Brian. I mean, Velma is basically uh, Lamana's mom. <laughs> <laughs> they look identical. Minus the glasses. Mm-hmm. Solving short, crimes. Short hair, yeah. yeah, solving crimes, drinking wine. You know, <laughs> it's like the adult version of Velma. How old are they in Scooby Doo? 
Uh, I would imagine they're twenties. Yeah, I would say. I mean, they, they call were, them kids. No, they were in high school. They right? call them meddling kids, so they're probably not they're even high, drinking. They're high school kids. I don't think. I gotta tell you, Daphne school. does not look like she's in high school. All right, bro. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and look, neither neither does uh, neither does Conrad's character. Uh, Shaggy. I can't, oh, Shaggy. Shaggy. Shaggy looks like he's a thirty-five-year-old stoner. What did he just like come off the beach and find these high school kids and decide to go solve some mysteries? <laughs> Who yeah. is that? Actually, that sounds okay. pretty accurate. Yeah, it's <laughs> like Matthew McConaughey's character in uh, Days and Confused. Yeah. yeah, except he was like 20 in that movie. <laughs> is, is Scooby uh. Shaggy's dog or Fred's dog? Whose dog is he? He's everyone's Shaggy. dog. He's Shaggy's. Shaggy's, Shaggy's, he's Shaggy's. Dog. He's Matthew dog. Willard played a really he's great Shaggy, dog. by the way. Uh, if you ever saw the the real life version, oh, he's of perfect for it. Yeah, yeah he really, he really is. Wait, there was was there a real life version before the cartoon version? No, no. no. So there was a okay. So cartoon the car came out early '80s, probably. How have you seen a real life version of it? I didn't actually watch the movie, but I I know it existed. Mm. It I watched was like the movie. mid '90s, maybe. Yep. Was it mm -hmm. mid '90s? No, I think it was even later than that. I want to say it was like 2000s. When did I Know What You Did Last Summer come out? Scream. Or Scream. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. He's in Scream. That he was like mid-90s, right? Both you might be right. Though. Yeah, it was right around that height of Matthew Lillard's <clears throat> Interesting. career. Yeah, so late 90s. Yeah, late 90s, early 2000s. Maybe. 2002. Okay, yeah. yeah. Seems to make sense. I'm, I'm better with music. You know, soundtrack <laughs> of our life. What could this possibly be? What? <laughs> How, how, I mean, Hold that on, should be one landing has a tax. That should be like an emergency <laughs> alert system from the government. Like, how do you still have a ringtone for anything? No, I just I just forgot to put the the ringer off. Forgot Time to. Fuck out. Well, Alyssa just made a fucking male Nikki Glaser. Yes. <laughs> Tell me, let's see if it looks, looks like, like me. Like young Lamana. I don't know what it looks like when he's young. It's, young. it's a cleaned up Lamana. Yeah. A young Lamana. Like it, but, it could be Lamana's brother. <laughs> Does Guapo have access to this? Yeah. It's in the chat, yeah. Well, that's, that's it? What, wow. That doesn't look like Lamet. This that, looks, that looks like... This uh, is like a cleaned up Lamet with some hair. It looks like Ryan Gosling mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It, it looks you know. like a spitting image of I Ryan mean, Gosling. It literally looks Lamana, like Brian Ryan Lamet. Gosling. <laughs> Which right. now we're getting to the, the point where we're saying Lamet and Ryan Gosling basically the interchangeable. Yeah. They Put are. Basically the same. Put me on Queer Eye for the Straight Guy and I'm, yeah. I'm that guy. Exactly. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> Tell you what, buddy. Challenge fucking accepted. We will get a makeover team in here. We will queer eye the shit out of We're, you. Uh, man. Oh, the same day that they're coming for you. Fine. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Michelle will take a day. Put of me work in for makeup. That. I know we need to. When are we gonna do that? We need to find Same time a that artist. Matthew the astrologist comes in. No. Never. You <laughs> lost. Never. You lost. Just not happening. It, it, yeah, uh, you're right. I did lose. You lost. But you know what? It's gonna take some effort out of the collective here. To make me pay my price. And well, I'm I'll counting on the it. fact that that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know why it's not going to happen? For the same reason that you walk in these doors every single day and go, Matt, what are we talking about today? <laughs> that's not how I speak. That's not how I speak. You actually I have to do something to right, make it happen. Right. You <laughs> can just come in and say, Matt, you know what? I want to talk about this today. But you know what? You don't. And you know what else is never going to happen? Me wearing makeup. Yeah, it will. Matt, oh. the astrologer showing up. We're going to make it happen. Never going to happen. I'll, so, bet, so I'll bet you that. You wear makeup. <laughs> what do you want to bet, young man? I'll bet you wear makeup before I give you something interesting to talk about on the podcast. Well, bet. <laughs> no bet. Absolutely no bet. Okay, then. Uh, no way. This can't be true. Somebody in the chat said Scooby Doo ran from 1969 to 1971. I was going to say, when you said 80s, I, I thought that was a little late. It's, Wait. They said it only ran for three years 69 not, to 71. That, that can't, can't be, be true. true. You're going to tell me I watched the same fucking episode? Right. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I had to watch all three seasons yes, 10 times. <laughs> yeah. Come on! No way! This is like People the most you, popular man. cartoon I can remember. I don't know. They remade it for like Cartoon Network and stuff too. Did they? Yeah. Or did they just... That's how I know. Or or just, what, do you yeah. think? what do you think? I was going to watch the 1970s version of Scooby-Doo? It was it, awesome. It doesn't mean it's remade. It, it just was fucking awesome. You, you could just be watching uh, in syndication. Like I watch Friends every night before bed. <laughs> you know, yeah. they didn't remake Friends. Know. I just watched the same 10 seasons over and over and over again. <laughs> It was too good of quality for that to be the case. It's even crazier. It says 1969 to 1970. Like, this can't be true. Just two seasons? Mm -hmm. Wow, that is wild to me. Um, Scooby Dooby Doo. So, speaking of entertainment, uh, <laughs> this is a little bit less of a light subject, I guess. Uh, That's not good. Well, you know, it, it, take it with a grain of salt. It's exactly what you would expect it to be. A very wealthy white man uh, is now under siege for sexual misconduct and wielding his power. Uh, over those beneath him. Mm. Vince McMahon has stepped down from the <clears throat> WWE. 
uh, this is kind of a big deal, I think, in the sense that uh, he's probably one of the most accomplished um, CEOs in the television arena. Uh, I was actually just watching a documentary uh, on ESPN 30 for 30 uh, about the XFL. So it's actually come XFL is relaunching this year. The Rock bought it, I think, yeah. or he's a he's, he's an a executive part, producer part or something. Partner, yeah. But ex or ex Steelers are um are, are head coaches. Hines Ward. Hines Ward. Oh yeah, and yeah. Rod Woodson. Rod and Rod Woodson. Woodson. Rod Woodson is coaching the Vegas team. Mm -hmm. Sick. Yeah. Um, but the the big um underlying storyline of the original XFL was that Vince McMahon and I can't remember the guy's name, but he is who ran NBC Sports um, since its creation, basically. Uh, uh, so, like, yeah, he was, like, the head of, of NBC or whatever. They were, like, best friends. So, you know, this guy is very, very, very powerful in the entertainment industry. Um, and essentially what happened is uh, I don't have all the details of who is accusing him or if that's even a, a thing, but I guess... Somehow the books of the WWE um, were made public or were audited in some capacity. And $14.6 million uh, was discovered to be paid out to uh, women basically as hush money. And obviously as that story broke and started to catch some waves, <clears throat> uh, McMahon initially push, pushed back and basically said that uh, you know he was never leaving. He did a whole unscripted appearance on... Uh, either SmackDown or WWE Raw, where uh, he kind of came out in the, the Vince McMahon character and did his whole spiel. Vince well, McMahon has a character of Vince McMahon? Yeah. Yeah, he's been like a he's part... He's character. He's been a part of the storyline for like three decades. Interesting. Uh, That's cool. Like, honestly, the guy is a genius when it comes to story. what the WWE is. Yeah, yeah, as as like a CEO and a brand. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's cool. But I don't think it's like all that shocking, sadly. To see that, uh, you know, he's not clean mm -hmm, whenever right. it comes to being a dirty old man who potentially uh, has paid a bunch of women to be quiet. Sure. Um, so with that said, fast forward now a month since that appearance, he officially stepped down. Uh, he's no longer uh, head of operations at WWE. Triple H, his son-in-law, has actually stepped into that position. So he's now the president and CEO of WWE. His daughter, Stephanie McMahon, uh, also has some uh, title. She, I, I'm sure she's like a part owner at a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, Triple H is basically like the face uh, of the company and everything else. But yeah, I mean, I think this will be a story that's interesting to follow and see how it unfolds. Um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, it's very easy to uh, see how this happened, especially like during the Me Too era. Like, it just seems like this is a big part of uh hollywood now which is uh, a, a sad fact to deal with yeah um i'm I mean, interested I don't think to it's just now what's that i think this has been going on way longer than just now it's right just right showing the light now yeah, yeah. i'm, I'm saying no yeah the original me too movement was what 2017 ish no I but think? i mean before that it was even worse oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. for decades for sure yeah. it like went Forever. unspoken about yeah yeah maybe longer it's the dawn of time <laughs> right yeah, yeah, so <laughs> yeah. without payments <laughs> they were just just now talking about right it, i guess what i'm saying now <laughs> is that like uh it's it's kind of gotten to a point where um at least in this particular setting i think that the general public believes the victims first and foremost yeah which is a good thing it's a good precedent to set uh, but in this particular case with Vince McMahon, everything I've read hasn't acknowledged like any specifics on the victims. So I'll be interested to follow this further and see if there actually is some sort of, um, you know, public admission. I doubt you'll ever see anything like. Right, I would story. imagine like with the hush money came yeah. NDAs and yeah. like all yeah. this other stuff. NDAs, mm. everybody signed an NDA, and that will never be spoken about again. Probably, like the money's already spent, the money's gone, like. This has happened probably years ago. I just the wonder. Only, go I say the only thing would be if there's other women that he didn't Correct. pay off, That's or it. that right. you yeah. Because I mean, who knows how far this goes? Right. Or how Imagine long they hear about other right. people were getting hush money. They're like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How, or maybe you know, maybe maybe it was someone who's like was just wasn't going to speak out. So yeah. he's like, "I'm not paying that person." Now they they feel like they're more empowered to speak out mm -hmm. because this came out. Six million, and let's say this probably was paid. Five to ten years ago, 
How many women do you think he paid? Why do you think it, why are you setting that timeline out of curiosity? Um, because I kind of just like get, taking the average of like when. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's difficult to say. I, I could imagine like the first payment going all the way back 20 years, or I could yeah, imagine all of this knows. happening in like the last 18 months. Like, who knows? It's, it's difficult to say. Yeah. Um, I think like the more interesting aspect of it is, uh, what are the ramifications moving forward? Like, because like, yeah, I think like legally speaking, if this was just a, an exchange of an event happened, uh, they settled out of court and they signed documentation that doesn't really allow this to be revisited, then like, we certainly don't have a Harvey Weinstein situation on our hands. Right. Or, or at least not that we know of yet. Um, but if like what Brian's saying is true, where now like uh, droves of women start to come forward and accuse him, this this shakes out very differently, right? Like, I guess what I'm getting at is like we have no idea the degree at which he's guilty uh, and how much of a monster he could potentially be in this scenario, as opposed to uh, you know kind of uh, a he said she said type of battle where uh, all we basically have are receipts. So I think, like, given his stature and uh, how fucking big the WWE is, like, uh, I was reading further um, once Triple H took over and they were talking about, like, plans moving forward and stuff like that. Disney's considering buying WWE. Uh, so, like, the Disney, ABC, uh, conglomerate, ESPN, all do, of that. Do you know how much uh, WWE is worth? I don't offhand. If it's not in the billions, I would it's be gotta astonished. It's got to be in the billions. It's Many dollars. <laughs> Many yeah. dollars. Uh, yeah. You know what? You're on the case. I got it. It's <laughs> like a lot of things. You know, what yeah. do you think it's worth? Uh, I just know you just saw the, the what's we call it. So, what do you think Connor thinks it's worth? Well, uh, <laughs> sorry. So, when I said that they're considering buying, uh, I, I think that it's a licensing deal, not like just WWE is now owned yeah. by gotcha, Disney. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. So, in W, uh, I'm sorry, in 2020, they were worth 5.71 billion. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Right. and that's so wild. Vince McMahon is so rich. He yeah. started this from the ground. Yeah, so like ago? that's that's kind of the thing is like uh, you know the bigger conversation to be had is <clears throat> where or like how does this reflect on the culture of the WWE uh, on you know rich CEO types of these companies and stuff like that beyond the scope of it getting brushed under the rug because a deal was made between two parties. Uh, and I don't know. I, I think that's difficult, but I think like, you know, once the dam breaks on these types of things, there tends to be a snowball effect and we mm -hmm. get to have more insight. We saw it happen. See it happen with everybody. Like, does this make it to court? I guess is what I'm getting at. Is, is there a realm where this comes to court? Uh, well, I think Brian's pathway is the only way that yeah, it makes right. sense, that, right? It, it, there would have to be more women that come out that uh, didn't sign NDAs or didn't Right. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, I found it interesting just because uh, I do enjoy wrestling. Or, well, I shouldn't say that. I haven't enjoyed it since college. Uh, I outgrew <laughs> How did you it. even enjoy it in college? He, he enjoyed it 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, well, it was popular then. I, it was, I, was, yeah. I enjoyed the idea of it. Like, oh I think God. it's really fascinating that they combined, like, sports and soap opera. Mm. Uh, and I, I marvel at the, the template that they've created. Right, like I think it's really applicable to a lot of other fields that haven't yet delved in. Um, but they were kind of, you know, they were kind of reality TV before it existed. They were kind of vloggers before it existed. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, obviously, it's all scripted and manipulated. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It, yeah, it's it's a lot of like what we talk about with poker, where it's like, okay, the actual wrestling itself was just the vehicle driving the storylines, yeah. mm -hmm. right? You didn't show up to actually watch the match. Right. So much of the hour-long show was, was all of the, the scripted up narration and, yeah. and the build-up and everything came, else. You just like, watch, like, the tea unfold. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. and then yeah. it's like, you know, then you watch this uh, orchestrated dance take place in the middle of a ring, and you're, <laughs> you're in awe of what they can do physically, but, like, that's not good enough to sell on its own. Yeah. Just, like, watching, you know... Uh, Adamo and Timothy Adams battle it out in a heads up pot with garbage on garbage blind on blind. It's like, you know, that's that's sure that's impressive. Yeah, it doesn't really do much. To but the... someone's going to win this hand. Someone's going to lose this hand. Yeah, At the yeah. end of the day, it's not really all that important. Like, right. I want to know more about these two characters and yeah, yeah. how it all builds. So how do you do that? How do we take the WWE stuff that does work well and move that into poker? 
be find, seeing people find, do it. find a Vince McMahon that's not willing to uh, sexually harass women. <laughs> what do we find a Vince McMahon that won't do that? No, I mean, I'm being somewhat tongue in cheek, but um, I, I do think it takes a visionary mm -hmm. and somebody also with deep pockets, right? Like when, when wrestling started to get built up in the late 70s, early 80s, yeah. it was all territorial. So it definitely didn't take a lot of money uh, to employ Vince's long-term vision. Uh -huh. It just took cooperation, right? Yeah. So it was very segmented across the United States. It was all territorial. There was like mm -hmm. Hawaiian wrestling and like East Coast wrestling yeah. and South Southern wrestling. And it doesn't, obviously it doesn't translate that easy because with wrestling, it's, you know, you, you decide who wins, who loses, who becomes the champ, who doesn't. Or with poker, you really can't do that. You can, you can create storylines, but you can't, you can't shift it in the way you want it well, to be to make it more. The results don't really like, matter that whoever much. Whoever wins is just going to win. Yeah, Why but the not? results don't really matter that much if you already have the pre. If you have this, if you have the storylines curated, where it's like you just plug and play, mm -hmm. whoever the 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 hand selected winners are, it still plays out the same. Like, uh, I think it. I think it translates sort of one to one when you look at the territorial nature of wrestling in the early '70s to early '80s, like that whole decade when it was still fragmented. Uh, it's very similar to the vlogging space now. Vloggers are massively fragmented. Mm -hmm. And there are some collections that work together. Yeah, like, you know, you get like an Owen and Nimi. Rampage you get like a Rampage and Mariano. You get like a Poker Face Ash and uh, like Jamin, Jamin, Jamin and DePaulo. Yeah. And like, you know, you get these little clicks and subsections, but it's still all very territorial, not by land, but by. Um, you know, fractioning it's off kind of like the, the, the characters. Yeah. They're both like Mariano and Ethan were both like LA type stuff. Like we're playing the same yeah. stuff or, and then, yeah, I guess like Nimi Owen just based off of like overall popularity, but like, why not just make a poker type of thing where it is scripted? Who That's cares, well, right? it all comes down to a, a, a third party handling and managing everything from the I top, see. top mm -hmm. down. Right. So like what McMahon was able to do was go into each territory and convince either the talent or the owner of that specific territory that they're better served underneath his umbrella and he was right until eventually it was just him and wcw and then eventually it was just wwe What's was, WCW? it was the second largest uh wrestling conglomerate like ted turner owned, owned it uh, -huh. uh and they were direct competition with wwe for probably 15 20 years then what happened it's man absorbed them is vince yeah. mcmahon the yeah. man it, is worth 2.3 billion dollars what is and what is vince mcmahon oh okay 2.3 billion and he makes 5.7 year from salary from there yeah that makes sense that's, that's uh right. i think i read that he's like 55 percent shareholder so that's that aligns so we need a vince mcmahon type for poker that will effectively round up all of the avengers and say they're better served working under one media without media umbrella them. yeah yes. yeah without yeah. Rape. yeah without the, the rape. Without, without that the, part yeah, yeah. That's right. part. interesting uh it's, it's hard but honestly like i i just see so many parallels because it nobody would have possible. ever thought that wrestling would be a billion yeah, dollar people industry. probably thought the same thing people right. are like oh like these are all everything's fractionalized everything's in their own territories like what is but it also it's just like everything's so niche in right? wrestling like, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if you go back to that time frame, That's you know, wrestling funny. was just like uh, a fake niche, little tiny industry that, like, was it? Yeah, yeah, it was just, it was, it was like the way NASCAR used to be. Another great example, mm -hmm. right? NASCAR used to be like a bunch of racing and then NASCAR was like in. super fragmented. <laughs> there were all kinds of different circuits and different types of, of, um, areas throughout the country uh -huh. like, that, that participated. Sorry. Like, think of these wrestling events, like in little high school gyms and stuff like that. Uh -huh. Like, yeah. nothing crazy. Like, a couple, yeah. maybe a thousand people, two thousand sure. people. Yeah. And that's how it started. Yeah, there were junkets. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, it was the same thing with racing. Everything was, like, on a junket. Then NASCAR came in as the, the major brand. Who's the NASCAR guy? I don't know. But So, uh, basically a Vince McMahon type. Yeah, NASCAR. but I mean, like, you know, NASCAR is interchangeable with MLB, which is interchangeable with NFL, which is interchangeable with WWE in this instance. Right. Like, there needs to be... The, the thing is, is that it's a big opportunity, but it's a big risk. And uh, secondary to that, um, you basically have to either create incentives for people to work under you, or you have to create a monopoly where they have no choice. How do you do that? I mean, Kerry's in the best position, or the guys at Triton. Yeah. Right, like they've they've created a platform and um, 
an event series. Truthfully, the WSOP is probably in the best position, mm -hmm. but they're they're too corporate, I think. Uh, like there isn't a singular entity that represents the WSOP necessarily. Why don't they just ha get one? Like why don't they um, just get a Vince McMahon type? Well, because do... they're just a tiny little arm of Caesar's Entertainment, right? Like mm. if you if you if if Jack Effel were the the uh, Vince McMahon of WSOP. Uh -huh. His ability to uh, impart any of these ideas that we're saying would also have to run through Caesars. Oh. So it's just like not a thing, right? right. But like Kerry owns Poker Go and nobody, right. he answers to no one. So if Kerry makes a decision, the decision happens. Correct. But if Jack wanted to make a decision, it would have to go to a Yeah, you have to run it up through corporate. And As, so who can do something for poker? That Kerry, Paul Fua, uh -huh. um, you know, these these very well-to-do businessmen yeah, yeah. who have created sort of a, a small fraction. So how do you do that? You just pay people basically to be like, Hey, like if you do this and you start like work as like a ex caught poker go tour ambassador. And well, I think that they would have to have a vision for it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, like it has to be like, you have to pour in enough money to make it entertaining enough for people to watch, which mm -hmm. will bring the advertisers in, which will bring more money in, right. and then you expand from there. But like, but it's not that risk, simple. You yeah. have to have a, a very well fleshed out vision. Right, of course, yes, yeah. And that's where the risk is. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Fucking Tom, he's the one for this. Tom, <laughs> come on, Tom, get on it. Tom loves the idea of being poker's Vincent Man. Like, he would, that would be, be all for it. I actually think like Tango at Poker King is in the best position. Like having spoken with him, yeah. he seems to be very passionate about poker. Uh, he's already done a lot of very profitable business, event, or he's had a lot of profitable business ventures in yeah. the space of poker. And you know, Poker King and WPT are actually like quite expansive with their ideas currently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're trying a lot of things with like ladies events. They're trying yeah. a lot of things with guarantees. Uh, the the club WPT is another arm that they're really putting a lot of yeah, yeah. money into. But it also comes with the hindrance of uh, they're they're really trying to do it on their own. Yeah. Where like if you look at Carry at Poker Go as a counter example, mm -hmm. he's doing the exact opposite. He's trying to basically uh, involve everybody, right? He's trying to have Triton involved. He's trying to get all the licensing for WSOP. He's trying to partner with GG. Uh, you know, he's basically bringing in a lot of hands into... Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I think to execute what we're hoping for, it's, it's a, bad a bad thing. thing. Uh, I think that in the near term for it's poker a as a whole, it's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. I think cooperation is 100% necessary. Yeah. I just think it's less necessary at the corporate level yeah. and a lot more necessary yeah, at like the, the talent level. level. Yeah. Of like people doing their own things like bloggers. Yeah. I think as a community as a whole we could we could spearhead this too in a big way, mm -hmm. but it would require like a lot of alignment to a singular vision from a whole bunch of different sectors in the community, like training, vlogging, uh, players, high rollers, mid stakes, grinders, online live like somehow finding some sort of representation or union of each of those individual spheres coming in underneath one solo umbrella where we all have split ownership right, right? and that's so fucking difficult how did he do it it was a different time uh i mean he was born into it his dad was owned a territory or sure. whatever um it was very small it was less mature than poker is now yeah. Right. It would have been closer to doing something in 2005 or six uh -huh. than currently. Uh, a lot less red tape in the 70s and 80s. Mm. Uh, Everyone you know. was watching the same TV. Yeah. There were three channels. There was literally three channels. Like cable didn't really exist at that point. So it was about finding a TV deal with, you know, one local channel in each region. Wow. And then eventually just leveraging that to saying, like, as cable became a thing, uh, we're signing a deal with USA you're much better served with us. You know, wow, it's a long cool. path. I'm sure that there was a decade where like it was, it wasn't going to work and he was probably on his ass. Right. That's the beginning of every tale of a great person. Who right. It doesn't, it doesn't just like bippity boppity WWE. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, don't get me wrong. Those <laughs> ideas happen. I'm sure. Yeah. But like rarely, Yeah. yeah. you know, like even if you look at like uh, a company like Disney, their timeline, it's not like they just were boom. We're Disney, we're the best, right? Like it was, yeah. it was a long 
struggle to becoming the the monopoly of cartoons and now entertainment as a whole. Man, like, that's a lot of fucking work. Think of the arms of Disney now. Man. There's so many oh, arms. They've, they've, they have sports with ESPN. They have regular cable with a- ABC. They yeah. have uh, movie production with Pixar. They yeah. have, like, I, I mean, almost everything that they... Almost anything that you can think of, Disney kind of has so, a hand in. So basically, there's a lot of like individual things that can run by themselves, which then operate under the umbrella of something else because it's beneficial to both. Well, like it's beneficial to ESPN and Pixar to be involved with Disney. Now it's more so that you can't compete with the size of Disney. Oh. And I think that that's also what prevents this like, from happening in the poker if space. You can't beat them, join them type of thing. Yeah, where you want to be absorbed by Disney because yeah. there's no way as an individual company you could ever compete. Right, right? it's like I can't make anything like that's Like Pixar's so happy to exit right. to Disney. That's like probably mm-hmm. the goal of a lot of- Correct. Yeah. Right, it's like my goal, the exit plan is to get bought by Disney. I mean, right. look at a lot of, there was a lot of NFTs that were like, um, <laughs> the, honestly, their goal kind of was to get bought by like a company like Disney. Right. Like, and yeah. Like sure. Because they're all kind of cartoonish, kind of. Yeah, yeah, so of like, course. But like, the be made goal is to get paid. And that makes sense because NFTs are in uh, aligning closer to the tech space. Yeah. So, uh-huh. like, tech startups are always being built with the idea of uh, an, an exit, exit multiple. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Never really with an idea of, I'm going to become the next Coca Cola or Apple or right. whatever. Like, right. I'm going to be a long standing company. 50, 60, 70 no. years from now. Like, in, in, their, in the founder's mind, it's like, if I am that, I will have exited by year 10. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, because you just get enough money to do whatever you want after that. Yeah, yeah and you can just create just something else. Something that's, new. Yeah. Disney's, uh, like, Disney's um, image is like a big globe, right? Kind of. Yeah, they just own everything. They yeah. just <laughs> knew it back then. They that's, just literally knew that's that they were the world. That's universal, I think you're thinking of. Universal. Oh, yeah, Disney's yeah, yeah, is the yeah. castle. Yeah, that's universal. Universal is also another one that's huge they is, it, is it right. unilever or is it universal? like dirt um disney no uh, universal is separate <laughs> yeah, it's different. it's like oh, MS, or it's, um nbc and uh, nbc universal that's all the oh, disney abc universal nbc right yeah yeah i think so interesting Wait, what she said disney's abc universal's nbc Correct. right, right. Yeah. Oh, interesting um but yeah i think that that prevents a lot of growth in our space because everybody has such autonomy that it's right, not you don't a, have to answer to anybody yeah, it's not an easy sell to say, hey, let's all collectively get under this one vision. Uh-huh. Uh, when ultimately the, long, the long-term outcome is that whoever starts that vision is the one who gets rich. Right. Not or, the people collectively cooperating. Or there's like the exit, not exit plan, so to speak, but plan of maybe getting like an ambassadorship deal or something like that where it comes to like a different poker company that already exists. Yeah. Where it's not like trying to start your own thing with right. your own, like becoming your own operator. So yeah, speak. yeah. Correct. Like, okay, I want to join an operating thing that's happening now versus I'm going to create my own. Yeah, it's tough because there's good and bad to both sides. Um, the, the main thing is, though, is that I think without coordination, scale becomes very difficult to reach. But from an individual standpoint, scale isn't that important. Yeah. Right? Because if you're just like Nimi or Owen, who are just like the best at their particular space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they can reach effective scale on their own, yeah. right? Like they might make just as much money at 500K subscribers uh, having 100% ownership over everything that they do as they would if they had like 3 million subscribers but only had a certain percentage of the ownership and autonomy over what they did because, right, because something Stars else is them running them build instead. Them up or whatever, yeah. where it's like, okay, we're going to leverage our platform for you for a certain deal, which is beneficial to both, but in reality, the individual doesn't have to take it. Correct. Got it. Yeah. Interesting. All I hear is one thing here. What? When are we getting bought by Disney? When are we getting bought by Disney? <laughs> We're supposed to get bought by Google, yeah. man. Nah, Google's off the fucking. They're out. Google's, Google's out. out. They Google, took too long. You, we're not. We're, we don't want Google anymore. That's I, it. I disagree. If Google came with no, an offer right now, I think we'll take Google. it. We don't want Google. They tried to undershoot us. They're not giving us our love. We're not get, We don't feel appreciated. They're not going to give us e- love. Easy. Because Google don't feel owns appreci- YouTube, and they might just shut us down. <laughs> we still don't feel appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> but Disney now, we can become a little piece of that globe. Oh, oh that's universal. That's universal. <laughs> oh, man, it's just wrong. You, you, we'll take universal. We're not picky. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, whatever. Well, see, that's what that's what's happening, right? It's like we're becoming part of the exit plan to get bought by something that already exists. Yeah, like universal, be a piece of the globe, or be like a piece of um, Mickey Mouse's tongue or something. What if I want to create my own globe? <laughs> I mean, there's like four, three How or four companies. Are you? I don't know. We can 
figure it out. Wait, you're, you're going to create <laughs> like three, a, a Mickey Mouse Three or four club? companies that own all of oh, entertainment. Yo, Landon is sometimes, so privileged. He's sometimes, just like... Sometimes all you're missing is... all you. It's just one missing piece yeah. of a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the way you think, he's like, I can get money. That's cool. <laughs> like, it's like, what do I need? A couple million? No problem. You, no, <laughs> money's the easy part. It's the idea and yeah. the vision and the yeah, execution. Money's, that, mm -hmm. Yeah, stuff. money's the easy part. The vision is the hard part. I agree, but there's you know, money that's everywhere. Not the Honestly, the vision is not the hard part. Every ideas are a dime a dozen. It's the execution. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's knowing what to do with that right? money efficiently to actually execute your yeah, idea. That's part of the vision, right? Like the vision. Okay, yeah, the vision visionaries. Is like the grand vision of oh, I want to have this. Sure, everyone wants things, right? But part, part, part of, of the vision. Well, beat it. I mean, I think our in our space uh, in poker particularly, I think that there are a lot of idea guys that uh, suck at execution. Sure. So there's a lot of people out in the social sphere saying like, is this idea great? Isn't this idea great? And honestly, like I might be one of them every day. I have another opinion on like how <laughs> we can improve this space. Yeah. Um, but executing is fucking hard. It's fucking hard, man. It's like the idea that, or, or the notion that your ideas are worth so much right. that uh, you even speaking them out into the ether. It's like you're doing <laughs> the world a favor. Right. He's doing the world a favor. It's like, it's like, here's, here's a ton of value. Right. Now do something with it. Right. It's like, nobody's going to execute on it. Cause it's, it's impossible. And you know that that's why right. it's just an idea. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause if it was something that was worth working on, it would be actively worked upon. Right. Versus just talking about it. Yeah. Maybe the guy to go to is Haralabob. He knows how to do things. He bought a sports team. He gets shit done. Yeah. He, he really did. does. He just bought a soccer team. It's fucking dope. Harala Bob, if you want to create a globe, help us. <laughs> <laughs> help us create our empire. Let's, let's start with like a state map. Join, there's an extra chair over there next to Melissa for the only friends. You can be a, a, a special friend. Somebody did send us a map to help us with our geography. Yeah. They did. It's downstairs. We, have to uh, we, we could potentially examine it on Harala Bob's yacht while we flesh out this vision of yeah. how to... I mean, he bought a soccer team. Why not make which, a poker which team? Which soccer team? Um, let's see. He bought a soccer club in Spain. Yes. According oh. to the Poker News article. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, Maybe he could introduce me. To the soccer team? <laughs> yeah. Just to, to the team? To the, the team. To the players? Yeah. Sure. So I'm going to butcher the fuck out of this. Let's oh, go. Amazing. Oh, let's, let's go. go. Hey, let's hey, we're here for it. Uh... <laughs> Hi, it's a deal to become principal owner of the soccer club CD Castellón in Spain's third division. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. It wasn't even wrong. It's just funny. It's yeah. like, you guys don't even try. You just sit around and it, wait to meme on me yep. for the this things I true. mispronounced. But Chins just in the, the Dominican just shaking his head. Yeah, it's just the <laughs> fact that you, you thought you were going to butcher it and you probably did it really you probably did much. all right, yeah. yeah. I think it was fine. The Snickers over there would. That's because we otherwise. like to laugh at you. Well, we don't oh. like. We love. What am I, a we fucking clown? <laughs> we yes. Love to laugh at you. Yes. Live, laugh, love. We love to laugh at mm -hmm. you. We live to love, love. to laugh at you. Yeah, we yeah. Live to love to laugh. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Shout out to Haral Bob. I hope that this works out yeah. in his favor. Yeah. Uh, Sports team. Uh, I honestly, he would be such a fascinating guest. Uh, once we get to the point where we can actually do that. Um, Maybe we just need him to sponsor this podcast so we can all get headphones and actually take call-ins. There we go. But uh, in any event... We're trying to expand our empire. I, I would love to... <laughs> I'd love to pick his brain about a few things, but I'd also like to know, like, what the experience was like being uh, the analytical guy yeah, yeah. for a sports club yeah, and that why cool. that role kind of dissipated for him specifically or if it kind of like vanished altogether. That would be a highly sports-centric episode. Yeah, Melissa would probably Melissa, you'll be out. thrilled. Wait, you'll take you, your seat. I don't think it... I'll just disappeared. That. Well, I don't know if it disappeared at all, but I know he's not doing it any longer. Yeah, I think it just got like expanded. Like his like his thoughts were just taken and like run through the NBA now. Uh yeah, perhaps. Um I don't know. This is something that we talk about all the time, uh, where I think it's personally like egregious if every single professional sports team doesn't have a data analyst of course on their squad mm -hmm. but watching game. nfl games makes me think that either they don't have them the or the coaches just don't one. fucking listen to Bro, them honestly <laughs> oh like there's a bot on twitter that makes <laughs> better fourth down decisions there's literally than 95 percent of the coaches in the nfl <laughs> well, it's literally a bot that makes like perfect math like math decisions yeah. of like fourth down predictor bot and it'll be like some things will be like the most down horrendous it'll be like a punt on like fourth and one at like the 50 Listen. where it's like very clearly you go for it guys it's all situation. situational it's, it's just it's just like you gotta those, feel it's it. like the solvers right the solver says to do this well in this exact moment you know this guy is 
He's just not folding. Is my so contract going to get renewed? You don't, Am you I don't lose the trigger. Well, I, it's different in the sense that it's not like your opposition is not considered in these calculations. They are, right? Right. right? So it's like if it's fourth and one versus the Ravens on the 50, they're considering how often they get a stop on right. short mm-hmm. yardage. It's not playing the same spot of like versus the Ravens versus. The right. Chargers we're not generalizing and then Dolphins. landing in a spot versus old man coffee <laughs> and saying like, fuck it, I'm doing what the solver said. Yeah. yeah what do you, somewhere. What do you guys think it said that bot said on uh, fourth down? Fourth and goal, one first yard, well, one yard line. Seahawks versus. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't think that. What? The hell is Seahawks happening? versus Patriots. What do you think that bot said in the Super Bowl on the one yard line? The Patriots Seahawks. The the bot. What what bot? The, the bot Twitter is bot, the just fourth down bot. We were just the talking about. It bot. went for it. Like a hundred percent, right? Yeah, but so did so did the Seahawks. They he was asking what you no, would do. They what, passed the ball. They threw an interception. He said, what would it do? Would it, would it run or pass? I it guess. doesn't. That's yeah. not a thing. That's not the, the bot. It just says go for it, not go it for it. It says kick or don't kick. Yeah. Oh, that's not fun. <laughs> yeah. I but thought it gave you like. A lot of analysts came out and said passing was the correct play. <laughs> that, was a tough, that was a tough one to say, Conrad. I know. I got caught up for a minute. That was a tough one for you. Uh, um, I mean, I. I think I disagree just because Marshawn Lynch was Marshawn Lynch at the time. I was going to say, this guy was a fucking... There you go. That's, he's not, he's the, right. that's why you deviate. He's well, disagreeing. Deviate from what? There's no bots. He's I just said a lot of analysts. If there was. Analyst you deviate spot. from the analysts. Well, analysts what the are human. Says. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically they were saying that... Actually, I don't remember. I remember reading on it whenever it was a lot closer to the time frame. And there was a hard case for throwing in that situation because Russell Wilson could also just run. So you had kind of like two options. Yeah. Um, football. Yeah, tough to take the ball out of Marshawn Lynch's hands in that yeah. particular spot. Got to trust the line. It is a very, it's a very like topical kind of conversation when it comes to poker too. When it comes to the whole bots stuff of like a Nash equilibrium type of strategy, like call it the Munker preflop ranges or preflop ranges from anywhere, and then you run those. You start running sims. You run the bet sizes, right? Because like in a Nash equilibrium standpoint, you would say, okay, this is how you lose zero EV, but like Nash. Equilibrium and like a GTO are, aren't the same, right? Because the Nash equilibrium is you're playing at zero. With yep. like a GTO, or like if someone's making mistakes pre-flop or post-flop or certain decisions, like maybe your pre-flop changes. Like things would change based off of the errors that could have possibly be made. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, here, we're gonna get into a very big tangent here, so I'll try to keep this brief. <laughs> okay. Uh, the idea of game theory optimal. Yeah. Well, let's start with the idea of game theory. Every poker podcast ever. Yeah. <laughs> the idea of game theory is just the study of the mechanics of the game uh-huh. and uh, trying to find Nash equilibriums there within. So you start at a global level. Right. And the what what has been touted as GTO for the better part of a decade is the global strategy that reaches Nash equilibrium. Right. But we have to understand that we can't figure that out because the game is too complex and uh, our computing power is not strong enough. Uh So now we simplify and we do a lot of like bucketing and what's actually occurring whenever we truncate the tree that way Mm -hmm. is we are looking at a bunch of much smaller localized equilibriums Uh that don't necessarily equate to what the global equilibrium would be if we had vision over it. Right. So if when we have we more re- information, things would be different. Correct. So when we reduce it to the ranges that we've input, mm-hmm. as opposed to just letting the ranges run wild naturally, yeah. so to speak, uh, when, we, when we fix those ranges, when we fix positions, when we fix the number of players, when yeah. we do all of these things, we're continually shrinking the tree and yeah. we're zooming in on a very specific node that we want to know the equilibrium for, right? right? So it's flop texture of X right. with range Y with versus range Z X. with this fixed number of bet sizes that we can offer. Right. And now what does that equilibrium look like? Yeah. And that's why there's still so much freedom to freestyle. Of course. Right? Because there's a lot of money to be made right. in the idea of exploiting away from this localized equilibrium, right. which could ultimately still fit under the global equilibrium. So right. playing optimally in reality is just finding the path 
to maximize your profit for the right. exact spot it's that you're in. It's not about losing to zero. It's about making the most or losing the it's least. It's maximal, maximally exploitative play more so than minimally exploitative right. play. Right. And that gets minimally conflated minimally. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. There's a like, Nash Equilibrium yeah. tries to play minimally exploitative. It tries to <laughs> converge on zero. Exactly. Right? But the Sims that we run, because they are just a subtree, so to speak, of, of the global equilibrium, are actually just looking at how to maximally exploit the particular spot that you're in. Right. And then, you know, it's obviously predicated on the, the variables and everything else that we've kind of locked for. Right. Like playing a Nash type of style is when you're playing against someone under the same parameters as you. Right. Where like if you're playing in the same sort spots, of. like let's say like you're playing someone where we, my open range from under the gun is Nash and your button call is also Nash. Like now I'm effectively playing that this spot with this texture with the sizes if we're both choosing the same thing. Well, I guess that's saying, what I'm saying is that like we don't actually have any idea what exactly Nash, what Nash is for those spots. Right. Okay. Right. Because we still have to do a lot of trimming to mm -hmm. even come up with our estimates right now. Right. So we have like quote unquote Nash approximations. Yeah. Um, but even those are like pretty heavily flawed mm -hmm. and pretty reduced to uh, just what we're capable of now. Right. It's like it's uh, kind of just pr like but effectively it's good. really primitive. It's good. It's what allows for freestyling. It's what allows for the game to continue to grow. It's what allowing poker to be beatable. Yeah. Um, and honestly, like we're seeing waves, right? We, we constantly keep seeing these, these turns where there's a fixed period of time where everybody is a slave to the new information. And then we sit on that information like, oh, look, for... Oh, look, solver, like, I'm in. Yeah, I mean, think about, like, all the, the free content and the, the, the um, study content that was created in, like, 2017 to 2019, Before right? It was, time, it was so dense. Like, when Finding Equilibrium became a channel, when Got Doug you. was at his height. Sure, sure, sure. Um, you know, when, uh, when Dom started DTO. And yeah, yeah. The, the, the trend was moving heavily towards everyone in the community wants to know exactly Right, answers. you have to become the machine. Correct. And if you weren't, you were scorned. You're a loser, you, you suck, you're the worst. And Precisely. No now, you. now post-COVID, after everybody put in a bunch of volume online, yep. and we saw some really great players emerge yep. that are clearly freestyling a lot of spots yeah. and just like kind of working through logical frameworks mm -hmm. that replicate what the solver is doing, yeah. but don't necessarily replicate the results for the spot right. because they have more knowledge on the player mm -hmm. or... Uh, they they do certain things, if yeah. you will. It's like, okay, solver might mix a raise. I'm going to do it pure. Correct. Reason whatever X, whatever the case may be. Now right. we're coming full circle to we're really glorifying the people who are able to f strike a balance between the two. Yeah, yeah. And now it's about finding uh, guys like Adamo who are effectively maximally exploitative. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, and that's not a fair term because I think people conflate the idea of playing like not exploitatively being studied, not being whatever correct right, i think they, they, they like, think that like playing exploitatively yeah. means that you're disregarding right uh balanced play or it's the equilibrium opposite, where like you are that studied you know where the difference lies like you know what you can and can't get away with in the yeah. theoretical well it's also that every human being who ever plays this game is playing exploitatively yeah it's just to what degree right Right. Are some you trying, are closer to Nash. Are you trying to minimize how much your pool can exploit you, or are you trying to maximize how much you're exploiting your pool? Right. That's the spectrum. And everyone's going to fall in some gradient of that spectrum. Right. No matter how studied you are, no matter how much you try to replicate the solve, you're still on one end or the other. So this is where the effect... Because I remember I was talking with, uh, with Kevin about this, and we were talking about like the idea of experience. Mm -hmm. Right. And, like That has to kind of take into a role... And into account of like how to effectively play poker yourself, get better, like I guess how you become a better poker player besides just studying. Yeah. When it comes like the experience standpoint of like, okay, I've seen this bet size before. It's not it's not the nuts, right? Or I've seen a check here which is too value value dense. Or I've seen a three bet here which is two under bluffed. Like these are the kind of things that like with experience as well as like a Nash understanding and then practical, maximally exploitative approach makes you a better poker player every day yeah like being able to use all of these things at once makes someone the difference between like a good player and a great player yeah i, I wouldn't even look at it that granularly mm -hmm. i think that you study the game uh at our estimated equilibriums as best you can yeah to continually unlock more knowledge and logical framework right for how the mechanics of the game work like there's a lot more like the deep math. nowadays yeah and, and you, you unlock a lot more principles to the deep math yeah and then you just try to convert that to a, an applicable strategy in real time yeah so you just build a logical framework through which you think mm -hmm. and oftentimes you'll arrive at answers that are relatively close 
to what's actually happening if you study the equilibrium. Right. And that's all anybody wants to do, right? It's why we all have such beginner mindsets and are so willing to learn yeah. uh, from, well, I shouldn't say we all. <laughs> it's why good accomplished players don't tout authority. Yeah. Instead, they kind of, pres- they approach every spot with a beginner's mindset where they're like, well, what I know is X, but I'm completely willing to listen to what you know because you may have a different lens through right. which you're seeing the spot. Because there's also a lot of spots where it's like, I'm not sure if. And like when you start with, I'm not sure if, like you're just completely having deference to a potential different outcome. Yeah. Where like some spots, like let's say you know a spot in theory is like a range bet. It's like, okay, I know this is a range bet. And if you choose something else, like you can't really talk about that with someone because you're choosing to do something you know is pre- like theoretically incorrect. Like well, when- not, not necessarily, right? It could be a range bet. Yeah. But just because it's a range bet doesn't mean that it doesn't also have uh, other strategies that are available yeah. that have a comparable EV. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like a range bet spot could be producing, let's say, uh, 3% of the pot in EV. Yeah. And a mix of like B75 and check yeah. at certain frequencies could be producing like 3.1% of the pot in EV. Right. We would consider those comparable. Yeah. They're two very different strategies. Right. It's, it's a different kind of, it's kind of like a different choose your own adventure, if yeah. you will. And yeah, then yeah. like being able to choose your own adventure which allows you to make more money or like in a certain spot in ev is kind of the idea yeah. we're like versus someone better where you know it's a range bet it's like you're probably gonna range bet because that's closer to zero we're playing as in someone where it's like okay i know checking here is going to induce more bluffs than should happen or take a line that shouldn't happen which then generates more ev is worth something yeah but sometimes that's kind of like thrown aside because like the machine says range bet you're a fucking idiot because you because you checked yeah i think i think this is a good conversation. I, I didn't really necessarily want it to go this deep, but I, I sure. think this is a good conversation to have with Melissa and Conrad specifically because mm-hmm. I think that for both of you, I don't want to speak for you. Uh, so feel free to fill in so he'll the, speak to the, you. the void. Um, but I guess like with where you're at in your study, do you, find, do you find it to be very convoluted in deciphering like when to just abstract a strategy yourself and say like, oh, the machine says this, so I'm going to try to replicate versus like actively building some sort of logical step-by-step protocol that you adhere to in a hand. Depends what you're playing. Like if I'm playing online, I'm going to mostly go with what I think the machine would want to do unless I have like a very specific reason to believe someone might be over bluffing if I check a range bet board or something. Yeah. Um, well, application aside, I guess, when you're actively studying, yeah. which, which of those processes are you leaning into? Because I think that this is like a big sticking point uh, for people who are passionate about studying but haven't necessarily crossed that which barrier. Of which processes? Uh, so is it more so like trying to lean into memorization or is it more so building like a logical protocol? Logical protocol. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, memorization for preflop. Sure. Um, but other than that like it's definitely i want to understand how i can sharpen my intuition more so that like because i know that memorize it's not as efficient if you're memorizing spot by spot by spot and then you come across one that you don't know and your ability to intuit and logic your way through it is kind of less sharp because you've just focused on memorizing spot by spot by spot i I think the counter to that though is that i'm I'm, I'm, i don't want to argue for memorization because i agree with you uh but i think the general counter and i would imagine landon kind of learned this way so Mm -hmm. i learned similar to like how you do it i I think very abstractly so i look at one individual spot and i'll try to extrapolate it out to thousands Right. And I try to do so logically and rationally well, and I'll check it. you look at one it. individual, then you look at a similar one Correct. and then you try and find the common threads. Pattern between, matching. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's the way that I've always built. But that's also always been my framework of thinking, right? Yeah. For someone like Landon, I imagine it's the opposite. And this is the counter argument to it. It's that you can get in a ton of volume if your goal is to memorize. Yeah. So you could play hundreds of thousands of hands on a trainer if you so choose to. Mm-hmm. With the sole goal of basically mimicking, yeah, and creating muscle memory, yeah, and then after the fact, reverse engineering all of the why. I guess I kind of do that too because I do play on trainers a lot. So yeah. that was kind of why I posed the question to you because I feel yeah. like I guess if in that if you're saying like that's yeah, I guess for muscle memory, I think muscle memory is also important. That's what helps you 
notice the patterns to begin with is yeah. like having the reps in muscle memory. I, I think, think the difference between like you, you and I, when it comes to the, like the framework type of thing is that you were never told something was incorrect. True. Right. You always had your own thoughts and call it community friends, whatever. They'd be like, Oh, I like this for this reason. I like this for this reason. I don't like this for this reason. But like if you're playing a solver or like you're playing like a trainer sim and like you do something that's an EV error, right? You just instantly get the EV error button. And mm -hmm. then you want to think about, okay, why is it an EV error? Like, why does the machine say this is incorrect? Right. And then having that sort of helps you build a framework of why is this losing EV, but it's not actually asking the right question. Right. Like you're saying, like you're not asking questions. You're more so right, getting because, feedback and then trying to figure it out. On your so correct yourself. me if I'm wrong, but when that, when that occurs, yeah. Like is if your, I do something and it says error, like yes. blunder. When you get an EV error, yeah. true or false, the immediate, th the immediate next step action then is to dig into the solve at the hand level. True. 1000% true. Right. So to me, that's a big problem. I okay. like to redo it without looking. Okay. And then look once I get it right. But when you look is my point. When you look, it's at yeah. the hand level. Yeah. Right. Well, you look at the specific hand, but you also see other parts of the range within the I hand. I understand that. I understand that. But the reason yeah. why I'm saying that I think that this is a problem is because I think you skip the macro mezzo level, mm -hmm. right? So you never really take a look at what the global strategy is until the end. Yeah. You never really take a look at what the hand classes are doing until the end. You start with what are the blocking properties of this hand that would make it negative EV? What, uh, wh where does this hand rank in the hierarchy of my hands that could potentially make this negative EV? Like, why is this leaning passive instead of uh, aggressive? Or yeah. why is this leaning aggressive? Right? So you start at this very micro level. Yeah. And it puts a big emphasis on things that I don't think really matter logically at a global level. Hmm. Right? Because, like, if you're analyzing suits yeah. in a spot where you made a negative EV decision... It's almost certain Suits are important. that you're wasting a ton of time because you probably got it wrong at the whole hand class level, mm. right? Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's very rare that you're going to make a negative EV decision strictly based off of suits or something that minor. Unless the negative EV decision is so fractional. It depends. I guess it depends on like what level you effectively get to because there are spots where like, we, I kind of call it with friends, like I, I call it like suit lording, where like you're using specific suits or blockers of suits to like unblock backdoors that flow, which allows yes, them to have more blocks. But generally in those instances, you're going to be looking at the difference between like zero EV and slightly negative or right, slightly or like positive a, and, and break even, slightly correct. positive, yeah. slightly negative. It's right? not a massively like, okay, you're losing X. Right. Like, I'm X saying being a, you look at a spot that you, you're five. losing point 0.1 big blinds. Right. Uh, if your instinct then is to analyze the candidate, pick the candidate apart. Yeah. What about the suits? What about uh, the jack is a negative blocking property? What about the king is a negative block? If you're, if that's your instinct, yeah. I think you're missing the forest for the trees. Uh -huh. Because your instinct should be, did I choose the wrong hand class here? Right. Right. Am I getting this whole hand class wrong? Yeah. yeah. Right. Was middle pair this hand a bad can. selection? Yeah. Right. I need to look at the global strategy in order to figure that out. Then I need to look at the hand class level in order to figure it out. And really this occurs at the bluffing side, less yeah. so than the value side. Yeah. Right. So the, the instinct to look at blockers now is even greater because you're like, oh, well, maybe I just got the, the suit incorrect here. Or maybe the jack is a negative blocker rather than yeah. a positive one. Like I thought where really you should be looking at the hand class level, because often you'll see a lot at that at that side that will say like no i should be bluffing my gut shots instead of my over with a nothing yeah type of thing there's a lot of spots where like i'll go through a, i call i'll call it like a spin cycle if you will where like i try to make it sound better for myself than it actually is where like i just get something absolutely wrong I'm like <laughs> oh like i was wrong but Copium. this hand does this like i'll, I'll take this out <laughs> but i want to tie type of shit you know we're like yeah. sometimes you're just fucking wrong like, yeah right? it's like when like, he ratchet? asked us to admit we didn't know what a socket wrench exactly was. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly ratchet. what that is exactly uh. <laughs> but like that stuff happens all the what time what do you think's worse me not being able to spell a slang word or you not knowing that a tool exists you spelling <laughs> a slang word the way you did and then tripling down on it. Crazy. Okay, the tripling down part, I agree with. The tripling down part, I agree with. You know, you know you're you right when Bernie just yeah. turns beet red. But, 
<laughs> you just know you're right. Yep. I'm all of. It doesn't happen that often. Not usually okay. he's the right one. Be so. green, buddy. Be green. Um, I agree with you on the tripling down part, but <laughs> let's not deny that you are still in denial about There's not knowing small that limb. a wrench yes. is a fucking wrench. I yeah. did not know that was I a wrench. I didn't know it was a wrench. She didn't know it was a wrench, but we weren't talking about the wrench. It's really irrelevant. It's, it's so it couldn't be. That's we're two ships passing in the night. I understand because to me because it is so relevant. You think that they needed to be spelled differently yes. in order to. I, I think it's them. incredibly relevant, I mean, but I digress. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, when it comes to the like hand level type stuff and the spin cycle, if you will, bluffing's hard, man. It like, is hard. Bluffing's fucking hard. Check raising's hard when it comes to overall global ideas because. The way that I effectively learned was a lot of trial and error for many, many hands playing online. You just get to play so many. I've probably played like over 2 million, 2 million hands now. And for the first million or so, I was somewhere in between like 4 and L, so like 2 cent, 4 cent, and 1, 2. So I just made a lot of errors and mistakes and still make mistakes now. But a lot of them were made at this lower level where... The mistakes aren't going to cost you very much. Yeah. But you will learn something. Right. Like and you, the, make, you get the pattern recognition. Yeah. And, you but don't know, you, don't you, you think that... Uh, I agree with you. The bluffing is the most challenging thing that you'll learn in, in theory. Yeah. Uh, but don't you, don't you agree that it's a lot easier to comprehend when you think of it as a cluster of hands rather than what each individual candidate is supposed to do? I, like we pull our yeah. bluffs from X hand class. Like the way I see bluffing um, in certain spots, like especially when it comes to... Like in position and out of position have different strategies when it comes to bluffing. Whereas out of position, you want to have more equity because you, when you get called, you want to be able to draw to something. You're also just getting called more often. Yeah, you're getting called, which is annoying because now you have to fucking make a good hand somehow. Yeah. Hard to make good hands. Where in <laughs> position, like you're basically just repping a really nutted hand or absolutely nothing because if you get raised, you now either fold or you snap because you have the nuts. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're kind of playing a polarizing type of game. But again, in both those instances, we can create a cloud of hands or a hand class. Yeah that we'll generally lean on to pull those bluffs from. Right. You just take the, you take the bottom of the range of the high card value hands most of the time that don't interfere with out of positions continue. Well, it's not even about defining what that class is. I'm well, just saying like as a general, I, yeah, but as a general idea, I guess is what I'm getting at. As a general idea, uh, the, the knowledge of how to bluff occurs yeah. at the macro meso level. And I think most people find it difficult to learn how to bluff because they're analyzing it from the micro level right they're just looking at a range they're looking at an entire range of hands and rather than uh, rather than moving up a level to the hand class and say like okay where are my zero to 35 percent equity hands classified like uh yeah, are, they, are they my so. ace highs are they my king highs are they my I my gut that. shots etc yeah. etc et right at the individual hand properties correct I, I i think that's what most people do yeah and that becomes it's too daunting of a task because if we actually look at the bluffing frequency, right. we'll see that there's a mixed frequency amongst a cluster of hands and the pattern will fall dense to a certain hand class, but then there will be others that are sporadically added in. Right. right? Yeah. Well, what you're saying is people will bluff hands that should not be or bluff them too much because that's all they can find. Yeah. They'll bluff specific candidates too much because they don't Right, look like an open-ended or a gut shot. So like when yes, it comes yes. to like practical bluff catching, it's like, okay, you're going to have open-ended here too much. Yes, You're going yes, to have yes. a gut shot too much. Right. You're not going to have the ace-deuce on like king, six, four, their three. Their bluffs are weighted towards like the very straightforward ones with equity where they're not finding those fringe ones right. to yes. balance with. And, and I think, I guess what I'm getting at, the whole reason I brought this up is because I think whenever you get to the an, uh, analytic analytical side of solves people tend to look at it by a hand uh, like at a hand by hand case basis yeah instead of like globally uh where it's just like okay here's the entirety of my range mm -hmm. and then here's my range fractionalized by equity right. or fractionalized by hand classes right uh what logically makes sense for me to pull my bluffs from Right. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a polar range, if you're the one in position, you're trying to make big bets, et cetera, et cetera, you can logically deduce I'm betting my highest equity hands and my lowest equity hands. Well, that's right in front of you now. Yeah. You can literally click on a subsection of, you know, the, the range explorer or the, the strength table and sort for hands mm -hmm. that are like sub 40% in equity. Right. Yeah. And, and now you get a vision of that. And you see that it's like three specific hand classes that you pull from. That becomes a lot simpler in real time now in practice mm -hmm. to say like, okay, 
I need some open enders. I need some gut shots. Right. And then I need some king highs. Yeah. Because it has this property or that yeah. property that, that is favorable right. for me. Right. And then you get folds and sometimes you protect yourself on certain run outs so the river comes a king. It's like, oh shit, now I have a value hand. Yeah. Where otherwise you wouldn't if you only bluff the, the open ended or you got yeah. or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I think that that was the, the major point that I was trying to make is yeah. that in general, the most complex aspect of the game as it's being analyzed by the populace mm -hmm. is being reduced too far yeah. to a micro level where we're only getting a fraction of the result. Yeah, well, that's... And it's pretty clearly seen and evident when it comes to call it a strategy section on a Twitter forum or whatever, where you see somebody take a line that in theory would be good, but you're also bluffing with zero, zero equity in a spot where it's like, oh, like I would never play this hand like this. Yeah. I would check and I would bet my open-endeds because if I get called, I'm going to leave myself out. Where in, real in reality, you want to check because if you get jammed on, you now have to fold all of the equity right. that you would have otherwise realized. Right. But that's neither here nor there. So in one sentence, basically, poker's hard. Poker's fucking hard, man. Hard. And you got to try really hard. Poker but, is hard. But it's poker. Fun. I'll, I'll it tell you what, fun. poker is so hard. So hard. Where is this going, dude? That Vanessa Selps put out a tweet. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yes. Opening up an offer. Ah, yeah. Her trading firm Wait, that she works at is interested in interviewing top poker talent. Bro, I went through the replies, and I have to tell you, if this doesn't discourage the dream for everybody who hasn't made it yet, it should. Really? There are fucking killers in this reply. Oh, no. <laughs> really? I haven't seen it. Killers. Bowie Effect is in there. Dan Zach is in there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but they're not. That's not because. But they're Pads is in there. Yeah, but they're gonna play poker still. Gonna, no, bro, you don't go work on Wall Street exit. and play poker Patrick still. Patrick is not leaving poker to go to Wall Street. His hands up. No, His hands up waving. I know Patrick. 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 He loves poker too much. Patrick, I see you. He loves poker too much. I see you, Patrick. You're not fucking leaving. You know. You know what? So people you're saying love. poker's gonna get easier. Yeah. Once yeah. they all leave. You want to know what people love more than poker? What? Money. Giga loads of money. Uh, money. <laughs> what, what, what this money thread, is easy, bro. We what, this about thread, this. what this thread dictates to me is that the best of the best are not happy with how much they earn annually. Yeah. Compared to, compared to their ability within the greater scope of the world. Right. Is it a monetary thing? Well, when, when the starting salary for the job that Vanessa is offering is equivalent to the top tier of poker's annual salary with no variance with no variance well some variance what's the variance trading you're trading oh it's a trading job yeah i yeah. thought it was like a corporate job uh i mean maybe also but well, it, I guess it's it could be both. it's a part of the trading yeah. firm. who knows that's talked to hey, but you're trading with other people's money correct yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you also have to find a way to get your risk of ruin to like single digits where we're used to operating somewhere in the 30 percent right. spectrum yeah that's yeah 30. that's um, true but also i think that's <laughs> 50? Bro, you're at like 500 percent risk of ruin. <laughs> but i also think that's that's what makes poker players desirable to them yeah because like, they're they not get, afraid of risk right it's easier to train the it, it's easier to train the risk taking out of you or or more importantly to calibrate your risk taking ability yeah than it is to train risk taking into somebody i know that's mm -hmm. like well everyone says that the people who are like naturally aggro are yeah. easier like to i'd coach. rather watch a red liner than a blue liner but 100%. i started as a total like opposite this like, beats that so risk averse yeah yeah that's common i think that's, that's super because common bluffing especially is women yeah. No, I'm kidding. Jesus Christ, it's a joke. It's a joke, guys. Lighten up. No, it's tr it's true though. No, women it's not are, necessarily women true. Women are on in general more risk averse than men. I, I don't know if that's actually true. Uh, I was I was making light of the fact that I could poke fun at you. Okay. Um, but well, it didn't work because no one's laughing. I think the beginners <laughs> as a whole uh, will trend risk averse. Like the, yeah. the general human well, populace as a whole. I think I just in general I'm afraid of making mistakes. Right, that's but that's not that's a you thing. I think it's yeah. a general human populace, right? We've evolved into not being risk takers. Yeah. Because it got us this far. Right. Uh, and then there's psychopaths like but then you want to Landon. Win. Yeah, but no, but then, <laughs> no, I, you but then so I've bad. had periods of swinging in complete opposite direction. So now I feel like I'm, I'm somewhere finding I think the it's balance. The, I think it's the feedback loop. Yeah, well, it's an overcorrection, and then yeah. it's like finding. The you spend a lot out. of time risk averse, and your your results are mediocre. Yeah, and then you see people who are risk takers that right. are crushing it. So you kind of like condition yourself just a little bit more at a time yeah. to yeah. take on more and more risk until finally you start to feel something. Yeah, and you're just like, whoa, let's go. Yeah, you, you, just, go. you basically just start floating people in position, waiting for them to check. That's what <laughs> happens. That's how your strategy changes. You just call. Yeah, just check. 
I got played. I played. A that's hand where some of us started. And that's <laughs> like when you get to. Right. I, played, please check, please I, played, I played a hand. I played a hand yesterday where like I just it doesn't matter what the hand is, but the guy chose the wrong flop size. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna float. This is not a good flop size. I'm gonna wait for you to check, and once you check, I'm gonna blast it. Yeah. And then turn comes, and he checks. I'm like, oh look, perfect. I'm gonna blast it, yeah. and he folded. Shocker, but it wasn't that shocking because he chose a bad flop size. But that's part of like knowing that. Nash equilibrium of knowing that certain flop sizes should or shouldn't be taken right. for X reason. Like if he really has a strong hand, he wants to protect right. it here and he's not. Right. So let's see. Or he would choose a smaller size with top of range. I have an he over would choose card. a bigger size <laughs> if he was like protecting or bluffs don't take this size. Right. Like once you sort of realize what size should be taken and yeah. then seeing deviations in that, you can start doing your own thing. Yeah. Yeah. But that comes with that comes with being that's a feast or famine type of strategy because mm -hmm. like you're either going to win a lot because you're smart and you can like outplay in these spots and you have enough of a knowledge or you just go with a completely opposite standpoint where you just go nuts because you want to try to find a way to win yeah. and you just keep running into it. Yeah. Like there's a hand I played yesterday where I just bluffed into quads. I'm like, oh, this guy doesn't have quads I know. and he I didn't. I into a boat yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> But that's part of the winning losing and you know, makes you look happens. like a psychopath and sometimes you'll get more action anyways. But. Sometimes he doesn't have it. Yeah. Jonathan <laughs> Little, Mike Leah, a.k.a. Go Leafs Go A, Christian Harder, uh -huh. Michael A. Savato. These are people in the chat, in the comments. That want this job. That want this job. Chris Kruk, Louis Spencer. Maybe there should be like The Apprentice, Jesus. but for poker players. That would be great. I wow. mean, effectively that's what it is. Dan Zach. Yo, Patrick Leonard, Anthony show. Spinella. Right? That would be so I think sick. they're more just interested in what it is, not actually taking it. They, they just want to feel desired. Yeah, they want to yeah, feel, they loved. Wanna feel <laughs> like they want to feel like they love. Well, because she's, you have to mention that she did say she wanted top poker talent. Yeah. People want to see if they fall in <laughs> to that <laughs> category. Oh, right. if you get, if you that's me. I'll yeah. tell you this right now. Out there. I'll tell you this right now. Uh, maybe they're all fishing for a little bit of a compliment. Yeah. But if she actually dangled the job in front of any one of those names, then I'll take it. Snapping. No way. I don't think Patrick Snappy. will take it. I don't think Patrick will Berkey take it. Berkey sent a text. No, nope. I don't think Patrick will take it. <laughs> Patrick, I know you're listening. Berkey, you're not going to take the job. Did you put your hat in the ring? I did not. No? no? I did not. Um, How are we going to save the house? Finance is just save an area. House. Yeah, what about saving the house? <laughs> I don't care about I'm selling the house because it's a smart <laughs> financial decision, not because I need the money or anything. <laughs> but gonna I'm going to take a job and buy the house. Okay, fine, but you're <laughs> well, you're being an idiot. Like, <laughs> yeah, obviously. The market is inflated. Yeah. Burke, I'm Burke, selling Burke. at the top. This is not this is not helping. What if uh, somebody is in? nobody interested listening in is the buying house. the house? Huh? What if someone's interested in? I can't wait to someone says, "Hey, I was gonna buy your house." Now, Burke, you just told them how yeah. bad of an investor right. it was. Now they're, now they're not gonna buy. Hey, it. I was gonna buy your house, but I heard you talk about it on the podcast. Yeah. So, uh, hey, I'm I'm no. not a realtor. I don't know how good or bad of an investment is. I, I just know when an asset nearly triples in value in three years' time, and you can see the top. It's a good time to try to liquidate said asset. I want to yeah. buy the house. Sure. Is it actually going to sell? I'm not I don't know. with you. I Probably agree. not. You know, maybe if, it doesn't sell at all. Who gives a shit? What if I buy the house, kick everyone out, and then move you in, Tortoise? Let's wow. go. Just <laughs> land in the Tortoise. <laughs> Can Michelle come too? <laughs> On weekends. <laughs> Third Saturday of the month. Ben has a lot of aspirations of getting rich, and he does very few things to actually make himself rich. <laughs> That's because I'm... You do a lot of things person. to make a moderate amount of money. For now. <laughs> when does it change? Later. Okay. Later. It's only 23, man. Uh, if, yeah, if you're anything like, yeah. But like. What are you doing at 23, Matt? I'm not money he driven. He's outperforming a lot of 23. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, 100% wait a minute, he's wait a minute, outperforming. Wait a minute. You're not money driven. I'm not money driven. But what's the difference, what's the difference here? Nothing. I'm warning you. Oh. This is what you have to look forward to. <laughs> no. A lot of fucking failure and disappointment. But, I, a, nice, <laughs> but a nice house that's worth 3x in its value. Yeah. Look, I've done very well for myself, but I could have done 10 to 100x better if I was absolutely bottom line driven. But are you happier now? I think, but no. that's only. <laughs> no. yeah, I'm not sure. But I don't know, right? Like, I don't think money German? makes me happy, but it I've doesn't. also never had $100 million. So who knows? Maybe it does. How do we get $100 million? Who cares? Disney. Honestly, like, I, I, I just. I care. I mean, yeah, it'd be nice to have, but like. Peace. When every time that I've come into a windfall, my. Windfall just means more money? A yeah, big, like a large a big sum chunk. at once. Yeah. Wow, imagine being so rich you call a money windfall. Uh, <laughs> for me, for me, when I have... <laughs> Man, I got a windfall coming funny. in. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be on windmills and money just falls from the sky? I'd be interested in owning a windmill. Well, you can be windmill Matt. Uh, no, I'd be Don Quixote. Uh, I'd just be out there with my fucking sword every day. Yeah. And my Who's donkey. Who's going to attack your windmill? <laughs> You're going to attack That's your own Don, windmill? Yeah, Don Quixote fought windmills. 
He thought he that wants they were dragons. to fight. But proverbial windmill here is the poker Twitter. Correct. <laughs> poker Twitter. Uh, every time I've come into a large sum of money, a uh, windfall. I'm not an anxious person by nature. I'm very, very rarely anxious. When I come into large sums of money, I get very anxious, and my natural inclination is to try to create. So, hence why we have a company. Um, and in hindsight, after the fact, even though it's been a great learning experience, even though uh, I've made money throughout the course of it, and even though there's been a secondary aspect of it that's probably boosted my career more than I can really measure tangibly, mm -hmm. uh, in hindsight, I would look back on it and say, well, that was a lot of work for not a lot of gain. Well, I could have bought Bitcoin. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Or I could have, uh, you know, th there's a million things. Like I Start could have done, I, I could have started a club on uh, Poker Bros and made yeah. a few million that way. Or I yeah. could have done these other things that don't really align with my personal narrative right. or, or life view. Um, so it's easy in hindsight to say like, I could have done a million other things to be richer, mm -hmm. but I put myself back in that situation. And I think to myself, like the only thing that quelled my anxiety was knowing that I was putting my money to work yeah. in a way that I thought was, uh, improving at least my local community. And even if you consider my local community to just be the six of you, uh, that was important to me, awesome. right? It's like it, being able to, being able to employ my friends, being able to ensure that they're, they're taken care of. All of that is what I see money as being a, a tool for. Yeah. Yeah. So even though that has that nice feel good narrative behind it, it doesn't drive me to want to collect all of the money in the world and have the high score. Right. Right. Because I know that as that starts to in increase, like if I would have had a $10 million windfall instead of a $1 million windfall, now I have 10x the anxiety. Where do you even get a windfall, bro? Yeah, where do I sign up wait, wait, for? Where do we sign up for windfalls? You Conrad, get, do you want a windfall? Give fifth of the super high roller. Imagine ball. the anxiety you would have if you won the Mega Millions. I got eight, two, actually. Can they call it the Mega Millions? Wait, that's what I'm saying. Like the anxiety for me, yeah. then. Uh, like, what do it, I do with this $800 million? <laughs> yes. It, the, 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 I gotta the, do something with it. Like, I don't feel calm in those yeah. situations. Yeah. The, the anxiety scales in accordance to the right. money. It's you just feel like okay. a sense of responsibility. Um, partly, but I also feel like more money, more problems. No, I feel like uh, I feel like doing nothing is both a waste of my personal well, it is, value to it's the world, devaluing with inflation. So well, it's it's yes that aspect too. Like I feel like it's it's a problem with the money, but I could just stick it in a low interest yeah. yield or something like that and be fine. I don't want to do those things because I feel like then I'm devaluing myself, mm -hmm. right? Like I have now this opportunity to leverage all of this uh, good fortune that's been cast upon me. And again, I'm a risk taker by nature, right? So it's like the anxiety builds from all of these things coming to a head at the same time. Yeah. A bunch of opportunity met with a bunch of risk, mm -hmm. met with uh, some level of vision, but very little confidence and guidance yeah. in how to do everything. Like, I don't have a business background. Right. Starting a business from the ground up was like a complete throw my hat in the ring. I think I'm smart enough to figure out on the fly. And in some instances that was true. And in others, I have egg on my face for it. So it's like, uh, I guess I'm very kinesthetic in that nature where I'm willing to learn. Mm -hmm. Why do you laugh? It's, <laughs> it's an because, idiot. Because you, are, because you are an egg. You are an egg. Yeah, I you are an egg. egg on your face. You are an egg. <laughs> you, are what you are on your face what you are. Mr. Egg. An egg. <laughs> Eggs are delicious, okay? They're delicious and nutritious and superfoods. And sometimes they get a windfall. Sometimes they get a windfall. <laughs> The problem is when you get a windfall, you're going to have 10% of yourself, you idiot. You're right. <laughs> That's because I want my friends to also have windfalls. No. It, when, when you have to have be, the windfall first. Right. When, then, when theirs become you know. greater than yours, you fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> when you, when you, here's the scenario. <laughs> Landon was, was backslash sold. Well, no, yeah. You were just backed for the main event, right? Yeah. Like We collectively had your action, right? Yeah. So he has like... Somewhere between 35 and 50% of his action. And then we... We the, don't have to talk about this, man. Uh, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, I, won't, it's fine. I won't go into specific Mistakes details. Are made, dude. All I'm going to say is when that falls are lost. Landon swapped so much that had he won the main event, neither himself nor anyone who had a piece of him would have been a millionaire. That's true. What? <laughs> I swapped a lot. I swapped too much. So basically, he needed 20 other people to win the fucking main event yeah, for us to, to care. <laughs> <laughs> all the windfalls had to happen at once. it all out so and you bust in two hours. Class. Ten percent of you more, but not more, but not enough. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs>
I'm bad at saying no, man. Uh, my friends say, hey, do the, you want to... if it's that, you have only so many chances to run pure I get it. in a spot I get like it. that. If that's the one time you do, and you have, like... That's the whole scenario the I dollar. analyze in my head yeah. before I give it's any tragic. pieces away. I just, yeah. just If I want it, how much would I regret? And we'll talk to right. Aspen about this, because like he openly said he swapped 43% or something along those lines. Yeah. And, and like that's a number that starts to make me uncomfortable. Yeah. But when we cross that fifty percent threshold, like you I'm beyond have the majority share, <laughs> like the majority share of yeah, the score. Yeah, yeah. You want I just like that. being yeah. wanted, man. It's kind of like the same thing uh, in owning a company too. It's like I couldn't imagine starting something and building it from the 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 bottom up, yeah. and then being like a ten percent shareholder, unless I know. it had come with an exit, and I got right. bought by Disney. Yeah, yeah. 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 If you Disney was ninety percent solved for Y, right? If if Disney was ninety percent solved for Y, I'll stick around for ten. Make yeah. an exception. I'll yeah, make some, some creative decisions <laughs> for There'll be some windfalls in our future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, also, future. I would only want to own 10% because the rest of the, the other 90% of my attention would be addressing the anxiety that came with the fucking check Disney gave me for the rest of my company. <laughs> yes. Disney, if you're trying to give us a check, please. Like, okay, okay, I guess I have to be the Vince McMahon of poker now. What are we starting? Let's start Disney. <laughs> wow. Uh, Disney buys us just so we can start helping them become an even bigger Disney. Wow. We become, they give us money to become Vince McMahon's. Yeah, mm. I think wow. all uh, you know, I don't want to be Vince McMahon anymore. He's kind of synonymous yeah, yeah, with I mean, No, but not, not that part, obviously. The fucking good part. Right, right, right. Take the right. good part. Yeah, the good, sure. bad the part. Good part. Right, yeah. right. The alter ego, yeah. if you will. You take, yeah. Fuck, man. I just want to be wanted, dude. <laughs> <laughs> nice my friend, throw, throw your, my friends uh, say to me, hey, do you want to swap? And I'm like, you know what? Sure. Fucking E4. Except Conrad. I love this for them. Except, <laughs> except Conrad except in the car. Conrad, Conrad made you... the deepest run of anybody that he had the opportunity <laughs> yeah. to swap with. I wanted Conrad huh? to win. I wanted Conrad to win out of spite because That's I didn't swap. That's two years in a row. Yeah. He asked you to swap, and That's you just put your headphones in. two years in a row. We made in. the deepest run. Swapped with absolutely nobody in this room except for. That's not true. <laughs> you swapped with me. Right. You, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. You swapped with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, and, and Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. The, oh, you mean this year? We swapped last year? Uh, I think we swapped when we got the money. Same thing with Toby. Okay. Yeah, the power of friendship did come that's in true. clutch, though. I won over the series because yeah, of the power of friendship. That's true. So. I did not win because I did not swap. Yeah, maybe if we Except maybe. with you, who Dang. lost outside of his swap. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you would have lost twice if I didn't swap. Good job, swap. Matt. Good job. <laughs> yeah. No, I did lose twice. <laughs> My cash went to you because oh, I did. <laughs> You swapped with me. Yeah. It was great. It was genius. <laughs> I also swapped with Chin, who never played, so like it was just off, yeah, always. Of course. You didn't have to give him extra money because you didn't play. That part's true. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to be wanted, throw your hat in the ring on this uh, Vanessa substread. Maybe she'll I, pick you. No, I don't want to leave poker. I don't want to swap fired. anymore. I've learned my lesson, man. Mm. There I've are learned. many more lessons to learn, young I'll man. I'll have my, my own windfall, and then I'll have windfalls for my friends. I'll All right, let's close this show out. Windfalls. <laughs> Um, Friend falls. New show premiering on Poker Go this week. Well, actually, I don't think it's airing on Poker Go this week, but they're filming it. Uh, it's the No Gamble, No Future show. You guys may recall that this used to be a podcast that Brent Hanks and Jeff Platt hosted. They'll now be hosting with commentary. Uh, I believe the first two episodes are 200, 400. Um, actually, the whole week might be 200, 400. I'm not even sure of the specifics of the game that I'm playing, but I'm playing on Friday. Uh, lineup to be determined. We're just going in there blind. Pray for us. Do you mean any windfalls? Let's in your go. Future? Let's hope so. Yeah. I want to win a million. How much this is the smallest windfall. windfall you think? Why do you keep? Because it's it's important to me. I think it's relative. This. Relative it, to it who the person is. It depends on your percentage. Yeah. How, what percentage of your like net worth? Twenty percent of your net worth. I would consider or twenty five percent of your net worth is. Okay, a so windfall. it's not a number. Like if you like got like two hundred k, it's not a windfall. Or it no. would be a windfall. Uh, not for you, but for some other people. Yes. Okay. Yeah, got it. Correct. Windfall is just a term, not an actual dollar amount. Like yeah. you can measure like your twenty five percent is probably really, really low. Actually, yeah, that seems low. A baby yeah. windfall, maybe like fifty plus. Yeah. Yeah. If I found a nickel on the ground. But then again, <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Right. Uh, there he is. Love it. So what is twenty five percent of zero? Twenty five percent. Wow, you're the, the that one. means you have windfalls infinitely. Yeah. That and that actually does mean infinite windfall. Right. There's just a, a degree of. Well, after you have your first one, then, you know, like say your first one's for $100. <laughs> now, now you need to get... Windfall, hey guys, I just, I, I just got a $100 windfall. You laugh. You laugh. You were insulting some people out there for sure. Yeah. 
Um, there are some check to check folk out there that getting $100 would mean the world. I don't think that they would consider that a You're windfall. This more still, than it wouldn't change that. their life. No, I think, think it about has radio to be like sort shows. of a life changing sum of money. Yeah, but like near term, sometimes it does. Maybe. Think about like radio call in shows. Yeah, like I people would call it like who lose their fucking mind over a five hundred dollar prize. Yeah, I was but that's, that's, that's because number. of like the hype and the entertainment factor. Yeah. And sure, the money's useful. You're right in the sense that five hundred dollars doesn't go a long way. Yeah. But for some people, that's well, the the straw that gets. Yeah. I'm 100 percent agreeing with Berkey here. Really? Like, yeah, me too. The five hundred dollars goes a fucking long way, and especially in that moment. Yeah. Because the person that is calling the radio station needs that five. The correct big picture. It's unlikely yes, yes. that people are going to turn five hundred dollars into a million dollar no, franchise. No, it turns into a zero in a week. But like, <laughs> unless, you're Chris, unless you're Chris Parker <laughs> right. and you play satellite, right? Windfalls often just get spent. People yes. win the lottery for two point five million, and they're broke a year later. It's gone. Yeah, yeah. I, I have gotten two windfalls right now. I don't <laughs> want to say the word windfall ever again. For what it's worth, uh, Landon it. Landon has beat it into the ground. No, what? I can't wait till I win a tournament. And say yo. Windfall, windfall time. Windfall, baby. I buy windfall. Windfall's income. How much do you think a windmill costs? Oh, I don't know. I would love to get a windmill. Shout out to Doug R for the super chat. I got to it a little bit late, but we do appreciate you. Is it a windfall? As always. <laughs> I mean, it's a good we, we, we should, should call, call it the windfall like, chat. Five dollars is pretty close. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're not exactly windfall. out here killing it. <laughs> <laughs> the windfall super chat. We're hardly printing over here at the uh, software Y headquarters. No, we're losing money every day. Please help. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> No. Disney. <laughs> Disney, please. Disney, help us. Uh, save the house. Save the house. Uh, that's going to do it for us today. We'll be back again tomorrow at 12.15. Espen and Henry Kilbane will be joining us on Thursday. We're going to play you out with uh, a new little bit of comedy that the Pigtails production has put together through some uh, Poker Out Loud highlights. I hope you guys all enjoy. Please like, subscribe. Leave a comment below about your biggest windfall leave of all windfall. time. Just leave a windfall. For we'll us. see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> It would be easy to go wrong here and think that a cold call is available. There's sort of a stone bottom, which is what I'm at. I think we're gonna go somewhere in the neighborhood of third pot, which is actually probably bad. Uh, yeah, I don't know guys, guess we're just not gonna win any pots today. I don't play with Chris. I don't really care about this particular hand. Tough game, tight fold. Everyone's too good. We're gonna go for it again with uh, some big blind bullshitty three bet. I'm sort of effectively guessing. I'm not really sure what I'm gonna do on a diamond, to be completely honest, uh, which is completely fair. I don't even know what I'm targeting practically with a bet here. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know the math on how to make a pot size raise. I'm like 80% sure I forgot to put deodorant on today. <laughs>